Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here on Creme 2 News. First at four, I'm Whitney Ward. We are starting off with new information tonight into the newsroom just within the last hour. We now know Thor and Freya has reopened on most streets. So yesterday, uh, crews started wrapping up their work and reopening those streets. The project was expected to wrap up by the end of November, but then the cold weather hit and the snow caused additional delays. Construction began in March. It was expected to only last about six months. In total, this project cost $8.9 million. All right, a lot of snow certainly has been the talk of the town. We want to turn things over now to our chief meteorologist, Jeremy Legou. After a few days of not really knowing what the weather is going to look like here for the weekend, sounds like maybe we're still up in the air a bit. Ah, uh, I know, right? Yesterday <laughs> I was like, we've done it. We figured it out. And today, uh, to put it just bluntly, what I'm looking at back here in terms of weather forecast models, all of the ones that go into next week are saying something different. About a third of them say, get ready, it's going to be cold. About a third of them say, get ready, it's going to be snowing. And about a third of them say, oh, what we were talking about yesterday. Right now, 26 degrees, so it's a little bit cooler. But look at this, fog not too bad across much of the region. Three miles of visibility in Coeur d'Alene and Deer Park, four miles out in Airway Heights. As you head over Lookout Pass, things are looking a little bit, a little bit more foggy and similar as you make your way toward Ellensburg. But get this, that's a big improvement from where we were earlier today. And temperatures are staying a little bit cooler because of some of that fog taking us through the middle of the day. So kind of mid to low 20s across the region. Lewiston at 31, so you didn't even crack freezing yet. But here we go. There's our next round of snow. We already know it's coming. We know we're getting snow this weekend. Four to seven inches of it for the mountains of North Idaho. Three to six for parts of western Montana. And as we put it in motion, notice nothing through Saturday. We just kind of go through Saturday existing. But by Sunday morning, snow starts to develop. By the middle of the day on Sunday, widespread heavier snow. And that takes us into Monday. Monday, I think it's all around us, but mainly stays in North Idaho. So we wind up a little bit drier here in Spokane. All in all, it does look like we get a brief shot of cold. Ah, Monday, Monday is an interesting one. Do we top out at 17? I don't know. I really don't. The latest forecast model has us back up in the mid-20s. So, whew, I guess that's it. <laughs> all right, well, we will wait to see then, Jeremy. Thank you very much. We now want to get to some developing news here at this hour. Our newsroom just received court documents surrounding the arrest in connection to an eight year old's death. Now, yesterday, police discovered the body of an eight year old girl in a coffin in the back of a U-Haul truck in South Dakota. A couple was arrested on a no bond arrest warrant for homicide by abuse in connection to her death. They were arrested in Mitchell, South Dakota, after saying they had traveled there from Airway Heights. So our team here at Creme 2 is currently looking through those court documents and our Kyle Simchuk will share what we have learned coming up tonight on Creme 2 News at five o'clock. Another big story at this hour, the I-90 homeless encampment has now vacated almost half of the people living there. They are no longer handing out ID badges and are encouraging people to find alternative housing. Crem 2's Nathan Hyun had an inside look at the camp today. He's there right now. Nathan? That's right, Whitney. And as the temperatures drop, there's more urgency to move people inside. And as of today, there are fewer people living here since Washtop put up fencing around the camp. And Jules Helping Hand says that once a judge ruled in support of a restraining order against a sheriff's office, there have been no interruptions. They say that they have been able to move people into alternative housing options such as a Catalyst Project and the Trent Shelter. Their main goal is to still clear out the camp, whether that happens next week or in two months. That is our main focus is getting people into housing options. Yeah, it's freezing cold out here. Everybody wants to be inside somewhere in some appropriate solution. Julie Garcia says keeping everyone warm is their priority. There are still two heating tents inside the camp and campers have individual buddy heaters. They are also handing out blankets and jackets for those that need them. And Julie Garcia tells me that at last count, there are 377 people living here and they're continuing to move people into the Catalyst Project every single day. Live in Spokane, Nathan Hun. Creme 2 News. And in other top stories at this hour, a teenager from Post Falls is in the hospital after being hit by a car. So a Jeep SUV driven by what we're told was a 60 year old Post Falls woman was traveling 
eastbound when she hit the teenager who was walking. ISP is now investigating. Tonight, the Don Cardong Pedestrian Bridge has officially reopened after undergoing a big renovation. That bridge is the one that connects the University District with downtown Spokane. At work on that began back in May. The restoration is expected to extend the life of that bridge for at least another 50 years. The total construction cost was $3.3 million. The Panhandle Health District has reported four flu-related deaths. Three Kootenai County residents and one Bonner County resident all were over the age of 80. Though these are the first flu-related deaths the Panhandle Health District has reported so far this flu season. The positivity rate for the flu in the district right now is about 30 percent compared to just 3 percent last year. And in other news from across the northwest tonight, from the massive firs in the mountains to the maples and the alders that line the streets, new research is suggesting trees are saving lives. One researcher has found a link between more trees and fewer deaths. Kale Williams with our Portland sister station explains. We've long known the benefits of trees. They provide great cooling effects. They cut air pollution. They raise property values. And they just look good. But new research has found another potential benefit. Those trees you see planted along the sidewalk, they might just be saving lives. Jeffrey Donovan, a researcher with the USDA Forest Service, first started thinking about the relationship between trees and deaths years ago, after he did a study that found... Places that had lost more trees also saw more people die. What I wondered was, is the opposite also true? That is, if we planted more trees, would we see fewer people die? To figure that out, Donovan needed data. He was able to get neighborhood-level mortality data from the Oregon Health Authority. For tree data, he turned to Friends of Trees, a Portland-based nonprofit that has facilitated the planting of roughly 50,000 trees in the city since 1990. Then he used statistical modeling to start looking for trends. You're just looking for patterns. You're looking for where things move together or where they move in opposite directions. So in this case, things moved in opposite directions. More trees, fewer deaths. He accounted for other factors that could impact mortality, like race, income, and education level. And still, even after accounting for that, we still saw this pattern emerging. We're in neighborhoods where more trees have been planted, we saw fewer deaths. Donovan's findings were striking. In total, we estimate that trees planted by Friends of Trees are associated with about 15 fewer deaths a year in Poland. He was careful to note the difference between correlation and causation, though. We found this correlation. We did not find that more trees cause fewer deaths. But we do think it's likely uh, that trees are saving lives in Portland because we accounted for all, a lot of other possible explanations. Ultimately, Donovan's biggest takeaway was that the benefit of a tree vastly outweighs the cost of planting it. We estimate that the benefit-cost ratio uh, was over a thousand to one, which is, you know, preposterous. It's the type of thing you get in e email scams or something like that. Very interesting. Well, three months after filing a lawsuit, a group of neighbors from the West Hills area in Spokane are having their first court hearing. That's actually hearing right now. It just started at 3.30 this afternoon. Back in September, neighbors filed the suit over plans to open three homeless facilities in their neighborhood. The group is called Spokane for Safe Neighborhoods. They claim in their lawsuit that there was never any public process hearing, land use approvals, and no environmental review of impacts or possible alternatives.